to introduce our next speaker. Um, she has been introduced before on Wednesday. So for the sake of those that were not around, I shall do it again. Um, this is Professor Sue Focus. I hope I have said it correctly, uh, who is a senior scholar and professor in the, uh, in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Cape Town. She specialized in OBS and gynae while working at Harare Hospital in the 1980s, where she also had her first baby in the early 80s. So um, she um, was also involved in the Mashingo Maternal Mortality Study, which was an important learning experience for her. She is recently retired from 25 years as head of obstetric services at Mowbray Maternity Hospital, where her main goals were quality improvement of public sector maternity, um, maternity care and the promotion of respectful care. She is a member of the National Committee for Confidential Inquiry into Maternal Deaths with the responsibility of analyzing all deaths due to obstetric hemorrhage and deaths related to cesarean section in South Africa. Recently, she was one of the principal investigators in South Africa for the multi-country emotive PPH trial, which introduced a new approach for early detection and first response management for PPH. She has also done research and audit on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on maternal and reproductive health. Allow me to welcome Professor Sue Focus. Um, thank you very much for that introduction and good morning, everybody. It, it's very nice to be here. Um, there are many people I know who were teachers, colleagues, but there are also quite a lot of people who I don't think were even born when I worked here. <laughs> so it shows that I've got a bit old. Um, I'm grateful to, um, to have been invited to the conference, to have been sponsored by UNFPA. And I must say it's been the most interesting and well-organized conference, um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it, so thank you. So I'm going to be talking about the emotive study, and on Wednesday, some of you participated in the workshop, where, um, which was very practical. It was like how you do emotive. I showed you the drape and how you do the bundle. And today I'm going to talk about the trial that gave rise to the evidence, um, which, we, which is why we're promoting emotive. In a way, I did it a bit back to front. I promoted it first, <laughs> and now I'm telling you the evidence. Um, but so today is, is telling you the evidence for the trial. It was published in the New England of Journal, Journal of Medicine in May this year, so it, it's fairly hot off the press. The idea of emotive came from uh, WHO, uh, the, uh, the University of Birmingham, the UK, coordinated the trial. It was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it was performed in four countries, um, South Africa, and I was one of the PIs for that, with Prof Hofmeyer, who's, I think, the next speaker, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Kenya. So I think PPH is, and, and I'm glad the previous speaker did a lot of my introduction for me <laughs> about the extent of the problem of PPH. It is really a global emergency. And it just, I think, in the last week or two, WHO has put up its roadmap for combating the serious problem of PPH. And it included vaginal delivery and cesarean section. It's the most common cause of maternal death. Um, in the last seven minutes, there's probably been one maternal death from PPH somewhere in the world. Um, it also causes severe morbidity and this is in developed countries as well as um, and, uh, low income countries. The problem is that most PPH deaths are preventable. When I look through our deaths in South Africa in the confidential inquiry, 90% could have been prevented by the health system. So actually not doing enough to prevent these deaths. And the other problem is that death can occur very quickly with PPH within two hours if it's not recognized treated timelessly or adequately. And that's why I think this study, which is looking at the first response to PPH, which actually is usually done by midwives, um, is so important. And I, I hope the midwives are still here, that we're here at the workshop on Wednesday. Good, I can see you nodding. <laughs> because you're the important people, I think, in, in enacting the first response. So what the, the challenges the trial sought to address were threefold, mainly the first two. Uh, one was the missed or delayed diagnosis of PPH. Secondly was 
missed or delayed treatment once recognized, and the third was missed or delayed escalation when bleeding carries on, and we call it then refractory PPH. Now, just in terms of late diagnosis, um, most of us, I think, for many years have diagnosed PPH, which we say is 500 mils, an exact measure, by visual estimation. We just look. Are there clots? Is the linen soaked? Is it coming quickly? Um, and actually, our visual estimation is very inaccurate. A lot of kind of almost blood loss assessment experiments have been done with staff looking at various containers with blood in them to try and guess the amount of blood and we mostly get it wrong and so what happens in many places is that people say it's a PPH when there's bleeding and the vital signs has changed but actually you can lose a litre before the pulse goes up and you can use one and a half litres before the blood pressure goes down. So if we, if we try and diagnose it by vital signs, we're going to be picking it up too late. And sadly, I think we've been doing that for years and years, at least definitely in South Africa. And um, the baseline phase of this emotive study, um, as well as the CHAMPION trial on carbitocin, really gave good evidence that we are missing PPHs. And you may not be able to see this well because I've sat at the back and I know you can't see things well, but basically um, when we looked at, we weighed, we used the drapes and we weighed them an hour after delivery. So we got an exact quantity of blood loss and we looked at, the, this is before any treatment, and we looked at how many women, that's on the x-axis, on the y-axis is how many women were treated for PPH. And in our study sites, before we did the intervention, we were missing 52% um, of all PPHs at 500 mils. We were worse in South Africa than the other countries. We were missing 73%. Um, and even when it came to a litre blood loss, we were missing 25%. So that was objective evidence that we are actually picking up PPH late. And very often, we are not picking it up at 500 mils. So this was the aim of the study. It was to evaluate whether this emotive intervention, um, if we compared it with usual care, whether it had any difference on adverse PPH outcomes, implementation, and resource use. I'm not going to do the, the results for the resource use outcomes, haven't come through yet, but I'm going to address the first two aims. So the study setting was four countries in Africa. There were 80 hospitals altogether, and these were the clusters, and it was a cluster randomized trial. Uh, the women were the unit of randomization, and it addressed all women giving birth vaginally. We, didn't, um, we weren't covering caesarean section bleeding. And each country had one, we called it an adaptive site, which tested the intervention before we used it in the main trial. So as I said, it was a cluster randomized trial. So consent, uh, it's always difficult consent with PPH trials, but consent here was at the level of the facility and not the individual. And so uh, we started off with 80 healthcare facilities and we had a baseline phase for seven months where they all had a drape, but it had no lines on it and it was weighed an hour after birth and it really wasn't used for decision making and people carried on with their usual care. And then after seven months, uh, they were randomized. 40 were for the intervention and 40 were to carry on with usual care with the uncalibrated rape that was weighed. Um, and we had a two month transition where we put a lot of effort into implementation, how we were going to do it, training, etc. Uh, and there was always a qualitative, formative component. So during the baseline, there were interviews with staff to try and appreciate what the challenges were. And during the implementation, there was also interviews and observations to check that the study was happening as it should be happening. So this is just to describe what we did. And this is a bit of a repeat for those who were at the workshop on um, Wednesday, we, we, the early detection was by using a plastic blood collection drape, uh, which was placed under the woman's buttocks, <clears throat> either just before um, or just after the baby was delivered. And it had a funnel that you can see, um, and it had gradation, so you could exactly measure blood loss 100 up to, I think it goes up to about four liters. 
and uh, there was a yellow line at 300 and a red line at uh, uh, 500, which was the PPH, and it was kept on for an uh, hour after delivery. Now, during the study, because we wanted a gold standard to know if it really was a PPH, then at the end of the hour, the drape was weighed, and the weight on the scale was uh, photographed so we could be absolutely sure it was an accurate weight um, and that was the way that in the study we could say we had so many PPHs and we wanted to correlate that people were picking them up from the drape. Now in the real world when we use emotive we're not going to ask people to weigh drapes that was just for for the study purpose. And Um, so uh, the blood loss was collected, it was kept on for an hour after delivery and then um, it was very important to have some way of recording the blood loss and um, I've noticed you, in your maternity care record you do two observations, one at delivery and one after an hour. Now we have a special page in our maternity case record where the observations after delivery are meant to be done every 15 minutes for the first hour while the mother stays in the labour ward. And so we modified the chart that already existed to include a column where you, the nurse doing the observations recorded blood volume. So in the blood volume column, it might be 100, 200, etc. cetera. Um, and this was incredibly useful and it actually woke up a lot of people to the fact they weren't doing these observations properly. Um, and then at the bottom, in the you can't probably see it at the bottom, uh, uh, back, the, the sort of pink lines were when they should worry that it was a PPH. And often it was nurse aides that were doing our observations. So they were, uh, we trained that once the blood loss got to 500, diagnose a PPH, it is a PPH, don't wait for the, P, the vital signs to drop, you just treat it. But you might treat it before on clinical suspicion. There might be lots of clots. It might be only 300, but you know her HB was 7. So there was a, a trigger which was 500 and a trigger which was clinical. And in terms of once diagnosed, I said one of the problems was missed or delayed treatment, which we often call too little too late. Often with PPH, we had a sort of an algorithm which was try one thing, you know, wait 10 minutes, try another, try another, try another. And the idea of the motive bundle, the E stands for early detection and the motive stands for massage the uterus, oxytocin, tranexamic acid, IV fluids, examine the genital tract, empty the bladder and escalate. So that was to be done all together. Now obviously one person can't always do everything all together, but uh, it was rather than sequential, Everything was to be done, all those five things, whatever the cause of bleeding, once she got to 500. And, and that was a key element of the training. Um, this is now describing what was the content of the bundle. Um, I think I don't have to explain to people about massage or how to put up a drip ensure the bladder is empty or how you examine placenta and genital tract. But there were some differences with the way we'd give the oxytocin and tranexamic acid. Um, the oxytocin we did give, like I think you're giving it, we'd put up 20 units in a litre and run it quite slowly because we didn't also want to overload if we had a preeclamptic. And we worked out that by doing it that way, we were giving far too little oxytocin. So the protocol was actually to give 10 units of oxytocin. Now, we gave it in a little 100, 200 mil bag and let it run in. But I gather you don't have those here. Um, there's no problem in giving it by a slow IV injection. If you give it quickly, the woman gets hypotension, or intramuscularly, which was suggested to me, it can be given intramuscularly. So it, it's, you've already given the active management oxytocin, this is now the treatment oxytocin. The tranexamic acid, many people have used as a second line agent in PPH, but in this first response bundle, it's now a first line agent. It was given one gram, again slowly, the manufacturers say it should be given slowly over 10 minutes. And because we didn't want to stand giving it slowly over 10 minutes, we put it in a small bag. But again, it could be given um, IV slowly. So that, that was the package. That was the bundle. 
And what you can't do, and I've often learned the hard way in my career, you can't just put up a poster um, or give people a lecture and expect everything to happen. You've got to have an implementation strategy. You've got to be, you know, how is this going to happen? And so the aids to implementation were having a PPH box or um, a trolley, which had everything you needed for PPH except oxytocin that was in the fridge. A really concerted approach to training because labour wards, you have night staff, you have day staff, different CADA, you've got students, new staff, um, and we had to make a really concerted effort to train everybody. And the training included the, the sort of human factors, respectful care and team, how the team works and communication. We have a system called SBAR for communication. We then had champions in the various sites and it was very important that they put up a, they, they signed a protocol authorizing the midwives to do all the emotive because hitherto in most countries, nurses had only been given um, tranexamic acid on a doctor's prescription. So if once there was a standard operating procedure that enabled the midwife to do all these things, then it was accepted just like midwives give magnesium sulfate or um, put up oxytocin. And then we had an audit and feedback where each, each hospital, uh, we, PPH, severe PPH became an indicator so each facility could see every month how they were doing. So now, obviously, the results, and I don't think you will be able to read all this, um, and so I will tell you the essential features. So whenever you do a randomized trial, you have to show that your randomization worked and that both the intervention group and the control group are basically the same. So this study, this, this slide just looks at various characteristics, the age, the parity, previous Caesar, to see that they were similar in both groups. Uh, multiple pregnancy, antipartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, they were all similar. One thing wasn't similar, two things weren't similar. Um, there were slightly more women in the control group that were induced or had a retained placenta. But when this was controlled to, for in a sensitivity analysis, it didn't make any difference to the final result. This was the result that we were actually very excited about um, and uh, the primary outcome. And the primary outcome we were looking at was a composite outcome. It was mainly severe PPH of more than a litre, plus, uh, plus or minus laparotomy, plus or minus hysterectomy, plus or minus a maternal death. And um, there, for this outcome, in the usual care group, um, just to remind you, altogether there were 200 and 200,000 women having vaginal delivery. Uh, when it came to PPHs, um, there was about 15,000 in total. And when we compared the two groups in the intervention phase, the usual care group had 2,138 women with a, a severe outcome. That was 4.3%. And in the emotive group, it had come down to 794, 1.6%. So there was a reduction in very severe outcome 4.3 to 1.6, highly significant, and it was a 60% reduction. Um, and when we looked at the process, the implementation outcomes, was the reduction because we actually did do the study properly. If you, we looked at um, the detection of PPH at 500, in the usual care group, we detected 51% of PPHs, but in the emotive group with the calibrated rate, we detected 93%. So not perfect, but a lot more. Um, and in terms of compliance with the bundle, doing all five things immediately, it was 19.4% in the control group and 91.2% in the emotive group. Again, very, very significant changes. Um, secondary outcomes, again, I don't expect you to read all this, but we the first blocks are about PPH, which I've mentioned. We obviously looked at maternal deaths. Um, and those went down um, from 28 in the control to 17. And um, that was not statistically significant, but we weren't really powered for that. Uh, blood transfusion went down by 29%, and that's really important in a resource-poor setting. And our nurses, anecdotally, in our postnatal ward, were very happy because they hardly ever saw a PPH in the postnatal ward. If it happened, it occurred in the labour ward. 
So this is my last slide, and this is sort of going forward. I mean, there's really no point in doing research if it doesn't lead to some kind of action. And so it's important afterwards to think, now what are we going to do? We've got this really good result in a research environment, um, and what's the next step? And I think at WHO level, and in all the countries, it has been decided that we've got to roll this out. If we can reduce C severe PPH by 60%, we can actually save mothers' lives from PPH. So in terms of in South Africa, um, we are looking, the drape come, was imported from India, and we now have a local company who's trying to make the drapes themselves for Southern Africa. And Prof Hofmeyer in the next talk will talk about a reusable device for accurate blood collection, which is a plastic tray, the Materna Well tray. Uh, and I demonstrated this on Wednesday, and I, I think I gave about four um, for for your use. To, and I've given you the name of the distributor because it's a it can be reused, and it's a good alternative to having the drape, which is plastic. Um, so that's the first thing we're going we're doing, and that's in process. We're going to make sure that emotive becomes part of all our guidelines. We, our emergency training is called ESMO. I think yours is EMOC. Um, and it's in undergraduate curricula. Promoting PPH boxes, we're adapting our maternity case booklet so the post-delivery chart has a column for recording blood loss. Uh, tranexamic acid is already available at all our hospitals, but not in our clinics that do deliveries. And we would like our clinics to do emotive if they have a PPH. Um, and we're going to try and see if we can get that on the essential drugs list for primary care. Um, and we, we'd like it if severe PPH could become an auditable indicator. So each month when a hospital has its perinatal or maternal meeting, that as well as reporting numbers of deliveries, cesarean section rates, they also report on numbers of severe PPHs and adverse outcomes. So thank you. I'm just, um, just the... the at the right-hand corner is a picture of the plastic tray <laughs> that can be used as an alternative to the plastic drape, but it will be talked about in the next, um, the, the next presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. As much as possible. As much as possible. <laughs>